Hello everyone and Happy New Year. Welcome back to our first Medical Sciences Lecture of 2022 titled Can We Use the Immune System to Fight Cancer? Thanks very much for joining us. Um, my name is Anna and I am a current third year student in Applied Medical Sciences here at UCL and also your chair for today's event. In light of World Cancer Day approaching next week on the 4th of February. Today's fascinating lecture will discuss the science of biohacking, where biologists go into a patient's genetic code and reprogram their immune system to recognize and fight cancer cells. We want to keep these lectures as interactive as possible, so please make good use of Twitter and the Q&A function on Zoom throughout to submit your questions for our speaker. The hashtag to use on Twitter is hashtag FMS lectures. I'm delighted to now introduce our speaker today. We have Dr. Claire Roddy. So Dr. Roddy is a consultant hematologist at the UCLH and um, an associate professor in hematology at UCL with a particular interest in adoptive cell therapies. She's completed an immunotherapy uh, immunotherapy PhD at UCL with Carl Peggs and subsequently undertook a clinician scientist role with Martin Puel to de develop the UCL CAR-T program. You may have also seen Dr. Roddy around the news on this current revelation. Um, Dr. Roddy's current role involves preclinical development of novel cell therapy projects, GMP manufacture and clinical trial design. She is also responsible for the Advanced Therapies Clinical Service at UCLH. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Roddy, over to you. Great, uh, thanks very much, Anna, for the introduction. And thank you everybody for joining us today. And um, we're going to look at the subject of using the immune system to fight leukemia and other cancers. And as Anna says, I've been working with um, Martin Pule and Carl Peggs on the UCL CAR program. And so I guess it's a good place to start is to look at leukemia. Um, and leukemia is something that's been described over many um, centuries, in fact, um, by myriad different uh, researchers. And in fact, Rudolf Virchow, a German researcher in 1847, he described a case of a 50 year old lady where the white cells were explosively overgrown in the blood. And this patient also had tumours in the armpits, groin and neck which I guess correspond with the lymph node areas that are depicted in the, in the cartoon here on the right-hand side of the slide. And she was um, extensively investigated for signs of infection that could be driving this suppuration of pus or this explosive overgrowth of white blood cells, but there, were, there was no evidence of any driver. So he concluded that there must be something intrinsically abnormal about the white blood cells. And he defined this syndrome as a leukemia so leukos is the Greek word for white and white blood cells. So acute lymphoblastic leukemia is where we sort of start our talk today. And it's a difficult condition for us as haematologists to manage. It's the uncontrolled expansion of a subset of immature immune cells or blasts as we refer to them. And these blasts are um, dysfunctional. They can't perform any useful function um, um, as far as blood is concerned. And what's even worse is that they destroy the bone marrow and they essentially obliterate all of the architecture of the marrow and remove the space for normal blood cells to grow. So in a sense, the kind of typical patient who comes into the clinic will complain of um, the sequelae of, of having no functioning blood, um, blood counts. So they're anemic. They may be bleeding because of blue platelets. They may have infection because they've not got functioning white blood cells. And they may have constitutional symptoms like fever and weight loss and bone pain, all of which relate to the, the presence of the leukemia. And they may also have a large spleen um, if you uh, examine their abdomen, and they may have lymph nodes that are large enough to feel in the neck and other areas. And it's been a very difficult challenge for uh, physicians over the years to manage leukemia. And William Castle in 1950 says it's palliation, a daily task, it's cure, a fervent hope. Uh, and this really um, was the kind of modus operandi until Sydney Farber came along and really revolutionized how we think about and, and manage leukemia. Now, he was a, um, essentially a pathologist who worked in Boston, um, and he developed a scientific interest in what was described as the hopeless condition of childhood leukemia. And at that time, there wasn't any cancer research really to speak of. And the only cancer treatments available at that time were radiation or surgery. But of course, that's unhelpful in the context of a circulating uh, cancer process like a leukemia. 
so it can't be targeted in that way. So he reasons to begin this sort of process of understanding leukemia um, and to begin scientific discovery on that subject, you need to really be able to measure it. And leukemia is a fantastic subject for that kind of experiment in the sense that it can be easily measured in the blood. And if you can measure the leukemia, you can measure the impact or the potency of an intervention to, to treat that leukemia in living patients. So he took inspiration from all sorts of areas and including the work of an English physician called uh, Lucy Wills. Um, and Lucy Wills described folate deficiency. And she did this by um, uh, an examination of a profound anemia that was described in some factory workers in Bombay. And interestingly, and I don't know how they came to discover this association, but they gave these, um, these, these, these factory workers Marmite and the, uh, the, the anemia resolved. So they were able to determine from that that the constituent folic acid within the Marmite was able to cure this anemia. Um, and so, of course, we know that when cells divide, well, they need to make copies of their DNA. And actually, folate or folic acid is really critical for this process. And in healthy people who make more than 300 billion blood cells every day, the lack of folate could really be very um, detrimental uh, to blood production. So with this piece of information, Sidney Farber thought that the application of folic acid might improve leukemia, partly because he felt that it would allow the normal blood cells to be able to grow again. He felt that the leukemia cells were perhaps preferentially um, using the folic acid and depriving the normal cells of that essential nutrient. So he devised a clinical study and he gave synthetic folic acid to a group of pediatric patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but the converse to what he expected happened, that the leukemia actually accelerated and progressed. So using this piece of clinical information, he totally revised his hypothesis and he figured that maybe if leukemia cells are so dependent um, on the presence of folic acid, maybe one should try antagonizing it or blocking it with antivitamins. And so he collaborated with a biochemist called Yella Pragada Subaru, who had been trying to make folic acid um, agonists and in doing so had created a range of antagonists in the process, um, such as the drug aminopterin. And so Barber took aminopterin and he trialed it in childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And pretty much for the first time in the history of leukemia, there was a patient who achieved a complete remission, totally unprecedented. And really, we can look to Sidney Farber as the father of chemotherapy for leukemia and for having sort of changed the landscape of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And as it stands at the moment, BALL therapeutics, there's multiple different um, drugs available to us. And actually, the outcomes for, for, for some patients are excellent. Um, so I guess we can look at this as saying, well, you know, is the battle with BALL finally over? You know, have we got good enough therapies? Well, the trouble is that in the context of leukemia, there will be proportions of patients who will relapse. Um, and in the pediatric BALL setting, um, you'll get 20% of patients who will relapse. Um, and the overall survival will be about 40 to 50% following that relapse. And in adult BALL, the, the outcomes are actually worse. 50% of patients will relapse after standard of care treatment. And the overall survival um, is, is, is poor. So novel therapies are still needed. And I suppose the question that we come at this from, these are patients who've had chemotherapy or they've often had radiotherapy. Um, and, and the question is whether or not we can use immunotherapies as a completely different modality um, to target the leukemia. So I guess if we're thinking about creating immunotherapy, we have to think about the building blocks that we're going to use. And as part of the adaptive immune system, we've got two very important subsets of immune cells called B cells and T cells. And what these do, they provide very specific immune responses um, to usually to infections, um, and they can expand very rapidly in the context of an infection, an incoming infection, um, and, and to, to target it and to, to essentially resolve it. So what we do in terms of designing immune therapy we try to exploit the anti-infection properties and functions of B and T cells. Now, B cells work um, by essentially making proteins that they release into the bloodstream that label infections for us. And once those infection or infected tissue or viral particles or bacteria are labeled, 
with these proteins, these antibody proteins made from B cells, um, essentially the dust in the, the uh, cells of the immune system, that's the macrophages, can come along, they recognize the labeled cells, the labeled bacteria, the labeled viruses, and they destroy them. So they can, you can create proteins or antibodies with very high specificity um, for bacteria at specific proteins on bacteria or specific carbohydrates on, on, on bacteria that can be recognized and destroyed. Our T cells work in a slightly different way. So they can selectively recognize cells that have been invaded by viruses or even cells with mutations that distinguish them from other normal cells within the body. And what they can do when they recognize these cells as being foreign or dangerous is they secrete toxic substances into those target cells to kill them. And there's been a lot of discussion over the years about harnessing what is this cytotoxic potency of T cells and redirecting it so that we can use T cells to destroy cancer cells. And in fact, there is a sort of a, a good history of using T cells to treat cancer. And in the context of certain cancers that we know are driven by viral infections. So for instance, the Epstein-Barr virus, which a lot of us will have experienced as glandular fever, it's a virus that we tend to harbor in our, in our bodies for our entire lifetimes and it sits latent um, in our cells. And, and what can happen is that sometimes when patients are immune suppressed, the Epstein-Barr virus can become active again and can drive um, a, a cancer type process. And we see it in hematology, um, it's called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. And researchers have looked at, given the fact this is an Epstein-Barr virus driven cancer, well, can you take Epstein-Barr virus specific T cells grow them up in the laboratory and give them to the patient and target effectively this cancer that is driven by this virus. And so in the lab, what you do is you take the patient cells or even a donor cells, and you expose them to um, a, a feeder layer of cells that will allow you to preferentially expand your Epstein-Barr virus specific cells. And you give them lots of a cocktail of proteins to help them grow. And once you've got your Epstein-Barr virus specific T cells, then you can give them to the patient. Now you have to take it from me. This is a picture of a patient's throat. You can see the teeth here at the front and you've got a patch of this lymphoma, this PTLD lymphoma at the back of the throat. But once you've given the T cells, you can see that that has completely cleared up. So there is a precedent for this. T cells can recognize and kill lymphomas and cancers. Well, in the context of the fact that this has a viral driver, but nonetheless, this has been shown to work in the clinic. Another way that T cells have been shown to fight cancer um, is in the context of tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. And this has been used mostly for solid tumors. Now, immune cells within cancer tissue, within a block of cancer that you extract from a patient, an excision or whatever, um, you can extract those T cells and they can attack some cancers, some particularly immunogenic cancers, ca cancers that are very different, if you like, in their protein expression compared to normal cells. And if you expand these cells up in the laboratory to very high numbers and reinfuse them into patients, it can lead to remissions in some cases. And so what you've got to take from me, this is a CAT scan here of a patient with a metastatic melanoma, which is a sort of a, a horrible um, skin malignancy and that in this case is seeded to the liver. And there's also a large deposit under the skin on the shoulder here. And this is a patient who received TIL therapy. And you can see by the CAT scan that after the therapy at 10 months, the, the lesion in the liver has virtually disappeared. And you can see that there's been a very um, impressive um, response in the shoulder lesion also. But there are potential problems here. So these viral specific T cells and TILs are unmanipulated cellular immunotherapies. And many cancers actually cannot be recognized by the immune system because, of course, the immune system is designed to tolerate itself to prevent problems like autoimmunity and so on. And of course, the other problem is that cancer specific T cells can be very difficult to isolate and grow in the lab. So how do we think about overcoming these things? Well, perhaps the solution is to create a synthetic immune system. So what we do is we take B cells and T cells as building blocks. We apply some gene engineering and synthetic biology approaches, and we can insert B cell genes into T cells. 
And what that allows us, we get that lovely specificity of the B cell targeting that we've seen through the antibodies in the previous slide. We've got the T cell killing capability that we've also seen in the previous slide. If you will, a chimera, um, it's a mixture um, of, 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 of different elements of the immune system. And what you then get, um, and it's what we apply in the clinic, is chimeric antigen receptors. So this is just achieved through genetic transfer of B cell genes um, into T cells, leading to the sort of paradoxical expression almost of an antibody on the surface of the T cell, the chimeric receptor. And so what this creates is effectively supercharged, highly specific tumor targeting killer T cells. And the interesting thing about this is, of course, this is like a living drug. So this single infusion of these cells can grow inside the patient, multiply into millions of daughter cells, and can form a part of the immune system in an ongoing way for many years. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, this is a cartoon of a car. On the, utmost, um, the topmost part of the, the cartoon, this is where the antibody portion is that can bind to your tumor or your tumor protein target. Then you've got this um, spacer region here, which projects the, the antibody binding um, element off the surface of the cell. And then you've got this really important bit at the bottom here, um, which is the internal portion of the, the car. It's the signaling endodomain, and that sends a signal into the T cell when it sees the, the tumor target. And when the antibody section binds the tumor target, it sends a signal into the cell to say divide, you know, kill the target, and, and, and to form part of the immune system. So that's the very simple structure that is a car. And this is what it looks like for our patients. Effectively, you take a patient with um, the, 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 the tumor that you've got the CAR T cell for, you take their blood, um, and what you will do is you'll extract their T cells from that blood. You'll then introduce the new gene, and we do that by using um, safety modified viral vectors that introduce the a new piece of DNA into those cells that integrates into the, the, the host cell DNA. Um, and once we've grown those cells to sufficient numbers, we infuse them back to the patient. Now we'll talk a bit about the most commonly used chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CARs, and that is CD19 CARs. Now CD19 is a target, it's a protein. It's expressed on normal B cells, so the cells that make antibodies, but it is also expressed at very high levels um, on, on B cell cancers. So that's leukemias, lymphomas, for instance. Now, the good thing about CD19 is the fact that it isn't expressed on other tissues generally. So if you give a CD19 car and you know that it's going to be present in the immune system for many years, you don't really want that car recognizing elements of your lung, your liver, your gut, and starting to attack them. So the fact that CD19 isn't expressed on these other tissues makes it a safer target for us to use. Now, in terms of the, the field of CAR-19 or CD19 CAR therapy, uh, it goes back 10 years, longer, when um, scientists first started conducting clinical trials. And this is sort of some early data from the initial CAR T-cell studies. And it's looking at the CAR T cell engraftment, the, the way that the cells um, made a home, if you like, inside the patients. And this is telling us, these little small peaks on these graphs, is telling us about how very poor um, the CAR T cell engraftment was in these early patients. And now essentially by day 100, the CAR T cells have been lost from all of these patients. So this is with these early CAR T designs. Um, and effectively, uh, the cells didn't persist, they didn't really do much in terms of um, clinical benefit, and they didn't really give much toxicity. So a lot of research then was conducted off the back of this, this these early failures to try and understand what went wrong. Um, and three really important elements came out of that analysis. So for CAR T cells to be effective, they need something called co-stimulation, which we'll talk about in a moment. You need to have a really robust, effective CAR T cell production process, and you also need to prepare the patient in advance of the CAR T cell infusion by using something called lymphodepletion. Now, co-stimulation, question, what is it? Well, effectively, this is supposed to depict the interaction between a normal T cell, a non-modified T cell, um, and its antigen-presenting cell. So this is how a T cell recognizes a 
foreign protein or a threat and um, is, is allowed to become activated. An antigen presenting cell will show it some element of a virus or a virus associated protein that the T cell recognizes and that will stimulate the T cell to start killing um, the, the virally infected tissues. But this um, interaction between the T cell receptor and what is the MHC on the antigen presenting cell in isolation, that is not enough to stimulate a T cell. In the normal setting where T cells are targeting infection, they need something called a co-stimulatory signal. So what that means is they need, it's almost like a belt and braces. It's the reassurance that the target that they're going after is the right target. Um, so the co-stimulation is provided also by um, the, the antigen presenting cell interacting with the T cell and common co-stimulatory molecules we use or we refer to are things like CD28 and 41BB. So that's how a normal T cell works and that's how a normal T cell becomes active. So learning, I guess, from biology and from how things happen in nature, this was applied then to, to the car field. So the early data that I showed you where the CAR T cells didn't really engraft and they certainly didn't persist was in the context of something called the first generation endodomain. And that is the signaling um, part of the CAR that I mentioned to you in the previous cartoon. It sends the signal into the CAR to say that the T cells should become activated, it should proliferate, and it should become cytotoxic and kill the target. But of course, here, we're only giving it a CD3 or a TCR signal, a T cell receptor signal. We're not giving it a co-stimulatory signal. So in some ways, in retrospect, we probably shouldn't be surprised that those early studies failed. Now, the next generation of cars were designed to incorporate a co-stimulatory endodomain, just through simple act of, of um, cloning in the laboratory. And you can see here that you've got the T cell receptor zeta chain with CD28, or with 41BB, or with OX40. And some researchers are even looking to see whether or not the addition of a, a second co-stimulatory endodomain, such as adding CD28 and 41BB to the same construct, might further improve CAR T cell um, activation in patients. And this was an experiment to try to demonstrate um, in a patient with leukemia, the superiority of a CAR design with a co-stimulation endodomain. And so what this um, lady, Barbara Savaldo did was she took a patient's immune cells, she took their T cells, and she made one batch of CAR T cells with a first generation um, CAR, and that is the one with just the T cell receptor signal. She then made another batch of CAR Ts of the same patient, leukophoresis. This time, the CAR had a co-stimulatory endodomain, and then she infused both of these products into the patient at the same time to see what would happen. And as you can see at this, this graph at the bottom of this, this slide is basically showing us how well the CARs expanded inside the patient and how well they persisted. And by that, I mean how long they lasted in the patient's bloodstream. And the, the blue line indicates the second generation CAR, that is the CAR with the co-stimulatory endodomain. And you can see how much better the engraftment and persistence is. And this one experiment was really enough to transform practice in the field and to reassure CAR T cell researchers that there is value in this technology. It just needed a bit of tweaking. Now, lymphodepletion um, is preparing your patient for the incoming CAR T cells. When you infuse CAR T cells into a patient who hasn't had um, some form of chemotherapy or radiotherapy before the CAR T cell infusion, effectively, you may lose your CAR T cell expansion. And part of the reason for that is everything in your body, your whole immune system is competing for nutrients, for oxygen, for space. And so in order to really maximize the chance of CAR T cell um, in, in graftment and growth, uh, you have to provide the patient with lymphodepletion to clear out all the other immunological noise, all those other immune cells that are effectively taking up space so that your CAR T cells can really grow. And effectively, this whole um, the paradigm was really developed over at um, the NCI. That, that was where it was all first proven um, in the context of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. 
um, where they looked to see whether or not the addition um, of, of, of lymphodepletion in one way or another would improve survival. And this Kaplan-Meier curve shows you that total body irradiation and chemotherapy are better than no lymphodepletion. So this whole paradigm was adopted by all the cellular, cellular therapy specialists and cellular therapy practitioners and is used currently um, in, in the CAR T cell field. And this is kind of how lymphodepletion works. You can see there's lots of different hypotheses here, but certainly getting rid of what's described as cytokine sinks, that's basically all the immune cells that use the cytokines that would really help the CAR T cells to grow. That's probably one of the major factors um, in, 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 in the sort of activity of lymphodepletion in helping CAR T cell expansion and growth. Now we mentioned a little bit about um, the manufacture process. You know, again, in the very early days, it wasn't a very sophisticated uh, manufacture process. The T cells were taken. Not a lot was understood about, you know, the, the phenotype of how those cells looked um, and, and, and what would constitute a good product. Um, but we're much more refined and sophisticated now. We have a lot more information and a lot more technology to help us understand the cells that we're producing. And the pictures in this slide are the clean rooms that we've um, been using up at the Royal Free Hospital um, in the Centre for Cell, Gene and Tissue Therapeutics. And you can see our operators here in the labs wearing the sort of protective suits with the gloves, the masks and so on. And this is basically a safety precaution so that we do not contaminate the cells for the patients. It's a very controlled environment um, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sort of rules and regulations around how we do this. And it's all about keeping the patient safe um, and making the best product, uh, most reproducible product possible. And this is a bit um, of a sort of a cartoon, I guess, of what we do. So we take patient cells and then we take the T cells out and we stimulate them. We sort of try to fool them into thinking that they've met an antigen presenting cell and that they perhaps there's an infection because that's the trigger for them to grow for us in the laboratory in a plate or a flask or a bag. Uh, and once the cells are activated and um, they're, they're starting to divide, then we introduce our new gene. And as I mentioned before, we tend to use a virus. Viruses are uh, very good at introducing their genetic contents into cells. And so we've got safety modified viruses that don't effectively, uh, they don't cause an infection problem, if you like. They're just really being used um, almost as a sort of like a delivery vector uh, for the, the, the gene of interest, which in our case is a car. And once the, um, the, the, the gene is introduced to the cells, we then grow them up, we expand them in the lab, um, and then we freeze them down and then bring them to the hospital to be delivered to the patient. And I've already mentioned there's chemotherapy here. This is this lymphodepletion I mentioned, again, clearing out the other immunological noise so that the CAR T cells have room to grow inside the patient. Um, it's a very complicated process. Uh, it requires a lot of very highly trained individuals. Um, when we extensively handle the cells, which has certainly been the case, particularly in the early days, it wasn't really good for cell fitness or cell health. And so essentially in those days, we probably weren't making the best products for our patients. And this slide, although it looks quite complicated, it's actually quite straightforward. And it gives us a, a feel for you know, what, a, what a good product really should look like in terms of the maturation status of these immune T cells. So what we really want, we want um, nice naive or early effector um, T cells to infuse into our patients because we know that these cells are associated with the ability first of all, to grow rapidly, but secondly, to be able to form immunological memory. We think that that's important. We think it's important that CAR T cells can reside inside the, 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 the patient's body, essentially protecting them from relapse at some sort of later date. So in an ideal world, we're creating CAR T cell products um, that haven't really been driven to exhaustion through some really, um, you know, uh, I guess, extensive manipulation in the laboratory, because we definitely don't want to end up with a terminally differentiated product, because those are cells that have a very limited shelf life in the patient and are likely to die out fairly quickly. So there's lots of things that we've learned over the years, ways to modify the process, make it shorter, uh, use of selective cytokines like interleukin-7, interleukin-15. There's lots of technology out there to help us make better products for our patients that will last longer. 
And the potential impact of car therapy um, cannot be underplayed. It's really been, it's, it's really revolutionized the practice of malignant hematology, for, particularly for B cell cancers. And it's been all over the media, as I'm sure you have all probably been aware of. Um, and really, this is the poster child for, for car therapy, who, um, you know, essentially sort of, uh, I guess, the, the whole field kicked off in lieu of her clinical experience. And um, she's called Emily Whitehead, and she had an incurable childhood leukemia. And she received one dose of CAR T cells. And we have to understand this is a patient who'd had a transplant and failed it, who'd had other types of immune therapy and had failed them and effectively was going to be palliated. Um, and actually, she had this one dose of CAR T and she got quite sick. There's no denying it, but she came through the other side and effectively achieved a long term remission from her cancer. So she really is. Um, it's an inspiring story for us all in the field and um, to see what CAR T cells can do in the clinic. Um, and, you know, she's not an isolated case. I think that's important for us to recognize. And um, there was a, a study that was conducted over at the University of Pennsylvania, which is in the US where she was treated. Uh, and of 59 patients who re had relapsed in refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and that's pediatric patients, and um, they were all end of the road in terms of their disease and their treatment options. And they all received a single dose of CD19 CAR T cells. And it really, in an unprecedented and rather remarkable way, 93% of these patients achieved complete responses at one month. It was really not seen uh, in, in this field. And, and furthermore, complete responses were maintained um, at around 12 months in about 50% of patients. So it sort of seems like if you get to around about 12 months and you're still in remission, then the chances are that you may have a durable remission. And again, you just it's just not something that you see with other therapies. And interestingly, if you look in the blood of these patients, you know, and for months and sometimes years downstream, you can still see CAR T cells in the blood. Um, and on the right hand side of the slide here, effectively, what this is showing us is the eradication um, of the CD19 positive cells. So they're um, seen here at the top of the screen um, in, the, in the, the top right quadrant. And you can see one month after infusion, these bad cells in this patient, the sort of leukemia cells, if you like, have completely disappeared. So off of the back of this uh, really sort of revolutionary um, clinical study, uh, the, the FDA in the United States licensed the first CAR-T products. And um, the first one for leukemia was licensed in August 2017, um, Tisogen Lec And there have subsequently been other um, CARs licensed for lymphoma. Um, including uh, Yescarta, which is axicaptogen, and um, other products like Tacartus and uh, Lysocaptogen. So there are the field is exploding um, at the moment in terms of research and options for patients. Now the problem with CAR T cell therapy, it's it can be hugely effective. It can be absolutely transformative, but it is associated with toxicity. And because of course the CAR T cells are circulating in the bloodstream. By definition, you can really have a toxicity anywhere in the body that, that CAR T cells can go. Um, and so the common things that we see, um, well, you can imagine these are T cells, the T cells that fight viruses when we get infection. And when we get a virus, and you know, the recent pandemic, well, I'm sure we're all familiar with what it feels like to have COVID-19, um, but those high fevers, um, the, you, the feelings of muscle aches, um, you're generally just feeling very lethargic. That's, the, that's exactly what you can expect to experience uh, with a CAR T cell because it's working in exactly the same way as a T cell that's trying to fight off COVID-19. Um, but the, the only caveat to that is if you have lots and lots of lymphoma or leukemia, of course, you may end up with very high fevers and feeling rotten for days and days and days. And actually, you know, if your patients are older and maybe they have other medical problems, they may not tolerate that too well. And so, of course, we have to be very careful with these patients, and that's why we often admit them to hospital for monitoring, and um, because they can end up with with significant um, complications from their CAR T cell therapy. Thankfully, there are things that we can do to help us manage um, this cytokine release syndrome, and there are drugs that we can use to try to take the fire out of the syndrome, if you like. Another inflammatory syndrome that we see in relation to CAR T cell activation and activity 
is neurotoxicity, and that's irritation of the brain. And it can present in all sorts of ways. Sometimes we get patients who present with, with mild tremors. There are other, other patients who develop the inability to speak as a transient phenomenon. We've had some patients who've had seizure activity. And the, the interesting thing, it, it doesn't seem to be related to the presence of disease in the brain per se. It just seems to be related to the degree of expansion and activation of the CAR T cells in the blood. Um, and it tends to self-resolve within weeks. Now, of course, if we're targeting CD19, well, then CAR T cells aren't clever enough to be able to delineate between a, a, a leukemia cell and a normal B cell to the CAR T cell. Everything is CD19 and it doesn't matter um, you know, what, what the sort of nature of the cell. So it's, the chances are that if you have a product that lives inside your bloodstream for a protracted period, you will not have functional B cells as a consequence. Now, can we live with that? We probably can. B cells make antibodies. We're likely to become antibody deficient. We might end up with more infections. But if we do end up with more infections, there are ways of dealing with it. We can receive antibody supplementation by having a monthly infusion of immunoglobulin. Another thing that happens with CAR T cells, and again, it's felt to be related to the, the, the degree of inflammation and the, the degree of the cytokine release syndrome, is prolonged cytopenias. So that's low blood counts. So sometimes we'll end up with patients who've not got really um, enough white blood cells to protect them from infection for several weeks and sometimes months after the treatment has been given. And so in those cases, what we do is we give the patient growth hormones for the white blood cells to encourage those white cells to grow. But there can be a period of time where a patient will come in and out of hospital with infections um, by virtue of this complication. Now, in terms of the pathophysiology, and that's why CAR T cells, um, you know, do, they, they're associated with these inflammatory conditions. This is sort of a cartoon, if you like, to kind of demonstrate the timeline of, you know, what, what time frame should we be expecting these things to happen? So, If you look in the center of the slide, you basically, you've got your conditioning. That's the lymphodepletion we talked about. That's that chemotherapy we talked about getting, making space for the CAR. And then we infuse the car on what is day zero. That's what we refer to that day as. And you can see that what happens first is the cytokine release syndrome that kicks off quite soon after day zero. And it's then followed by this inflammatory brain toxicity, this ICANS. So it's sort of, it's a kind of a classic sequence of events. You tend to get a fever, first of all, and you get your cytokine release followed by your ICANS, your, that's your neurotoxicity. And it's followed sometime later by an increase in the CAR T cell numbers in the peripheral blood. And then if you look at this, this is um, depicts all the cytokines. These are the inflammatory markers that are secreted into the blood by the CAR T cells and by the other um, immune cells in the system. And you can see that there's sort of classic um, uh, characteristic cytokine patterns associated with the different phases of the inflammatory process. Um, so, so that's the sort of the pathophysiology of the of CAR T cell sort of toxicity is, is illustrated here. And, and certainly um, CAR T cells are aided and abetted um, by the endogenous immune compartment. So cells like monocytes and macrophages are very instrumental in, in, in pushing that inflammatory syndrome. And it's usually in targeting the monocyte and macrophage derived inflammatory molecules that we then can tend to control um, cytokine release syndrome. And this is an example of some of the drugs that we use to try and block and switch off CAR T cells and um, the associated macrophages. We're using um, something here called tocilizumab. This is probably the most common drug that we use. It blocks a cytokine called interleukin-6, which is secreted in large um, concentrations by macrophages triggered by the CAR T cells. And this is in a very effective drug um, which was used in Emily Whitehead um, and essentially caused her fever to come down and allowed her to leave the intensive care unit to go back to the ward. So tocilizumab is very effective. Other drugs like anakinra can block other immune um, pathways such as interleukin-1 and uh, drugs like dasatinib, which are drugs we sometimes use for leukemias, um, can actually switch off the CAR T cells themselves. So there's as much as there's research going in to develop the next generation of cars and to make them better and more effective, there's also a lot of research going in on in the area of developing new and better um, toxicity management strategies to help us get patients through this process unscathed.
Now, not all patients have durable responses, as we discussed. Um, and, you know, there will be patients who relapse. And it's always, a, you know, a tragic thing for us when patients have no response at all. And um, th this slide suggests that that occurs in about 7% of patients. I think it depends a little bit on the condition that you're, you're treating, whether that's leukemia or lymphoma. Um, but essentially, some patients, there's just no CAR T cell proliferation at all. They come in, they get their CAR, they don't get a fever. The CAR T cell can't be detected in the peripheral blood. And when you look at the end of the, the 28 days, um, the, there's nothing ha has changed. There's no improvement in the disease. And it's probably in some cases to do with the fact that patients are so heavily pretreated. They've had so many therapies that their T cells have been damaged by that process. Uh, and, and, and as a consequence, cannot expand when they go into the patient. And there are ways that we can try and sort of check for that in advance. We can look at the, how the cells grow in the laboratory when we're, when we're making the products. If they're growing very slowly, that might be a warning sign to us that they might grow slowly in the patient. So as we get more sophisticated um, and in, in the way that we evaluate our CAR T cell products, it probably will start to give us more insights into products that will work versus not. And then maybe these are patients who we will devise alternate strategies for perhaps in the future. Now, there are some patients who will have a CD19 positive relapse. Now, this is after having achieved a complete response. This occurs mainly in patients whose CAR T cells fail to persist, so they can't be detected in the, the blood beyond three to six months. Now, usually the, the mechanism behind this is that the patient's own immune system sees the CAR T cell as foreign and attacks it and gets rid of it. And that's partly because the CAR, as we're aware, it's a synthetic protein. Uh, it's not something that our immune systems have seen before. And once patients have recovered from the lymphodepletion or that chemotherapy um, that they have pre-CAR, sometimes their immune systems can be strong enough to then reboot and then they see the CAR as foreign and destroy it. So that's one mechanism. And again, there's lots of approaches, lots of research approaches to try to overcome that. For instance, if you could take the CAR molecule and humanize it, um, or if you could give the patient more robust lymphodepletion, maybe you would prevent the CAR from being rejected. So lots of research work going into that area to, to, to try to minimize that as a complication. And of course, the other the concept is T-cell exhaustion. So T-cells aren't designed to be constantly active. And so if a, if a CAR T cell is continuously seeing CD19, because it's sort of seeing all these normal B cells being produced in the bone marrow, then that can lead to the CAR T cells just becoming exhausted um, and, and ultimately they can die out as a consequence. So, so those are the kind of mechanisms behind re, uh, rejection or um, CD19 positive relapse. Now CD19 negative relapse is effectively where the leukemia has outsmarted the therapy. So we've really put all our eggs in one basket by giving these patients a therapy that is directed to one single protein target. Now, of course, leukemia cells are very unstable gen genetically um, and, and they can manipulate their um, expression of CD19 in order to survive. And so of the two thirds of the patients who do relapse, CD19 negative relapse is, is what we commonly see, certainly in the leukemia setting. And it's seen as probably the biggest Achilles heel of CAR T cell therapy to date. Now, what does relapse look like? So essentially, this is a patient with um, a lymphoma, a CD19 positive lymphoma. And I've marked where the disease was originally. It's down in the groin. It's a very limited um, area of disease. But you can see that the patient at one month, that lesion in that groin had completely disappeared. However, by month two, you can see that it's come back and it's come back with a vengeance. So we went back to the, the, the biopsies that we had from this patient to have a look and try and understand why the patient had relapsed. And this is um, a, a sort of immunohistochemistry. It's a way we have of looking at um, lymph nodes from patients. And the brown stain that you can see on this is, is the CD19 expression. And you can see how much CD19 was present on this tumor before we gave CAR T cell therapy. But after CAR T cell therapy, you can see what's happened. Effectively, this is a patient who's entirely lost their CD19 expression. And of course, if you lose the target for targeted immunotherapy, the disease can come back. So how do we address this? Well, again, lots of clever things are being done. And clinical trials are being conducted, uh, looking to see whether or not we can overcome the limitations of targeting one antigen, one target, 
maybe by targeting two and sometimes more. Um, and in the context of B cell cancers, well, we can see that CD19 is expressed really broadly over the range of maturation um, states of, of, of B cells that encompass leukemia all the way up to lymphoma. So targeting CD19 and CD22 expressed on the surface of B cells would make sense um, for these conditions. So we'll await this with interest to see whether or not this can actually overcome CD19 negative relapse. And in terms of the patients who have no response or the patients who have CD19 positive relapses, is there a way that we can overcome these problems? Um, is it that you know the patients who have no response, we, if we give them uh, cells from a healthy donor that we might be able to overcome um, these problems? And so the question is whether can allogeneic or universal CAR T overcome poor patient products and improve access um, to, to CAR T cell therapy for patients with, with, with uh, very exhausted or um, dysfunctional T cells. Now, the beauty of an allogeneic CAR or a universal CAR over an autologous CAR, which is a patient specific product, is the fact that with an allogeneic product, first of all, you get nice healthy T cells from a healthy donor volunteer. Second of all, you can batch the product that you make. So you can make lots and lots and lots of bags of cells. And as a consequence, you can, in theory, treat lots and lots of patients. And where do you get the cells? Well, you can go to normal adult donors or you can use cord blood cells or you can even use stem cells as your source or your base material to make these allogeneic cars. All right, sorry, um, Dr. Roddy. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have a Q&A um, segment at the end. So mm. um, if we could um, quickly let's, just wrap it up. Yeah, let's, Thank let's you so move, much. Let's move forward. So basically, um, I mean, so allogeneic CAR T is definitely, it's a very exciting prospect for the future um, for, for CAR T, but it's not the only um, option. Now, CAR T cells are a major part currently of UK treatment pathways, and they're not without toxicity, as we said, um, but a significant population of patients can achieve long-term responses following a single dose. We are excited by the rapid pace of development, and to some extent, this is the beginning of the journey. And most of the CAR T cell research groups are working to really understand how we can get more products to more patients, how we can address antigen loss and those patients who have poor products. And as we get more efficient at manufacturing, the cost of CAR T cell is likely to come down. Uh, and although this is a story that's been full of setbacks and challenges for researchers, it's actually been transformative for patients. And of course, the future is really exciting. And you know, some of the things we're looking at in the UCL CAR program are aspects of better toxicity management and outpatient treatment and off-the-shelf CAR T cells and stem cell-derived cells and solid tumour indications and obviously TIL and TCR T cell approaches. So the, all of this is very exciting, but it's going to cost us. And you know, there's big ethical questions and financial questions as to whether or not this is should, you know, is is is, is something that we'll be able to sustain over the, the coming the coming years. With that, thank you very much. And let's um, move on swiftly to these questions so that we can, yeah, get to that part. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Roddy. So straight on to the questions. We've got a number of questions coming through from our mm -hmm. attendees. Yep. Um, so Evelyn has posted a question. So, so she's learned from class that um, cancer masses tend to be genetically heterogeneous and therefore hard to target specifically. And is there something that um, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy is able to overcome and how does it keep up with rapidly mutating cells? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. That, that is going to be the next frontier um, of immune therapies is, is, is getting it to work in solid tumours. And, and TIL therapies, we had a slide on it earlier. I mean, if you've got an immunogenic cancer, it can work. I mean, I think the, the studies from the, the US have shown that malignant um, metastatic melanoma, that can work. Renal cell carcinoma, there's some compelling data there. And things like maybe um, non-small cell lung. Um, but for other tumours that aren't so immunogenic, I think there are challenges around the use of TIL therapy, not least because TILs are also exhausted cells. Remember, those are cells that have been in a tumour and they have been activated in that tumour for a considerable period of time. So there may be even be simple things we can do about um, TIL health, you know, restoring maybe a little bit of uh, immune naivety to those T cells, um, rejuvenating them, if you like, just by the way that we grew them in the lab that might help them to function better. So that's for the so TILs. 
you know, for those indications probably are very exciting for the future. Um, it, in terms of CAR, again, it's about defining what those antigens are. We're getting more sophisticated all the time in terms of our, I guess, processing of tumours and our, uh, I, I guess, sort of identifying novel targets. There's a lot of sequencing going on. There's a lot of um, transcriptomic data. And I think that's where the future will will lie. And it probably won't be in a single target. It probably be, will be in multi antigen targeting. And I think our, our understanding and success in this field is going to rely heavily on us understanding the biology of the tumour and exploiting things like the, the fibrotic stroma, you know, so destroying the soil, if you like, that the malignant cells are growing on. It will probably involve us manipulating or destroying the immune cell subsets within that solid tumour that are protecting the tumour that have been uh, essentially programmed by the tumour cells to protect it. I'm sure we're going to have to use strategies to destroy and overcome those processes in order to reach the same sort of successes that we're seeing in the haematology space. But, it, you know, and I think people, you know, there has been some pessimism, but I think that's misplaced. I think it's just too early, but I think it, it'll be the next frontier. That's great. So um, the next question is kind of relating to the niche of um, cancer and how um, CAR T therapy can, the potential for CAR therapy to extend its um, impact across other diseases. So um, can this treatment um, also alleviate other conditions beyond cancer? For example, um, skin conditions such as eczema or keloids? So I, you know, I, in terms of keloid, I don't even I don't want to speak to that um, because I, I guess that, you know, it's going to be a very challenging ask uh, to, to, to get somebody to apply what is effectively a potentially life threatening therapy to someone who's got a keloid scar. I mean, I'm not a dermatologist, so I don't know about, you know, how sort of like the, the broader implications of, you know, what keloid scarring can do. So I don't think for that particular indication, I don't think that that, that makes as much sense. Um, but there are other, you know, conditions that are associated with significant morbidity and, and, and mortality. So, for instance, in rheumatology, things like lupus, for instance, you know, you can get a lot of um, target organ toxicities, renal failure and um, cardiac complications, etc. Brain complications. And we know that it's sort of to some extent driven by, um, you know, the, an aberrant immune signal and, and by B cells. So if you target you know, B cells that are creating antibodies that are causing the underlying condition, potentially in those sorts of indi indications where there is a morbidity and mortality associated with the underlying condition, I think that that is something that does make clinical sense. And, you know, there certainly are, there's, there's groups of people who are looking at even CD19 CAR T cells for lupus for that reason. And there's a lot of preclinical data. And I think, again, very interesting uh, looking at so patients who've got cardiac fibrosis, um, and and uh, using fibrosis targeting CAR T cells um, to effectively see whether or not they can disrupt the, the, the fibrotic core that is disrupting heart function and to see whether or not that might engender the production of normal myocytes again. So I think, you know, there will be in the regenerative medicine space, I think there's definitely going to be, there'll be a CAR T cell uh, branch um, looking at those sorts of indications as well. So, you know, so definitely people aren't monocular about this and it's not all just about haematology and it's not all just about cancer. I think the application, people are very creative. There's a lot of imaginative people in this field and I think um, the, the, the reach will be very broad. So with the market size that is as big as um, for car therapy at the moment, um, it's very novel research. And so with any novel treatments, there is still the potential for patient relapse. So for those that do relapse from CAR T therapy, um, once they relapse, did the levels of remaining um, CAR T cells rise? Well, it depends on why they've relapsed, you know? So um, if you've got a patient who's relapsed because they've rejected their CAR, well, clearly the answer is no you know, because that's one of the main mechanisms of relapse we discussed just a few minutes ago. If they've lost um, the target in question, well, you know, I, the, the CAR T cells can continue to, to, to thrive in the patient and you're, then you've got the worst of all worlds. You know, you've got the ongoing B cell depletion and you've got the rapidly growing cancer. So it's not a great situation. Um, and, you know, there are some people who um, have designed and deliver CAR T cells that have suicide 
switches inside them to, to enable them to delete the car at the point at which the car is no longer required. Um, again, there's reticence to use that in a sort of like a global um, ubiquitous way, partly because anything that you introduce into a cell by definition makes it ever so slightly different from the host and therefore makes it more of an immunological target. So people are reticent to sort of use it broadly, but, you know, again, it would be, I mean, it's another mechanism by which you could switch those cars off when they are no longer required. That's, cl that's clarified quite a lot. Um, so you've previously mentioned the cytokine release syndrome as part of one of the um, potential toxicities of CAR-T therapy. So um, is this form of toxicity um, similar to the um, effects caused by the immune response that a vaccine can trigger? Uh, yes, in, in that sense, um, it, whether similar to the response that you can see with an infection, and a vaccine is there to mimic an infection, albeit like a safer version of the infection. So any inflammatory process um, that is at the root T cell driven uh, is, is, is able to, if you like, create a CRS. But of course, it, I mean, a CRS is it, in this setting, the, what, what, what sort of, I guess, makes it distinct is, is the fact that there's often a lot of disease and so um, it, it can sometimes be quite difficult to control. And you've obviously got like a kind of a growing, the leukemia continues to, to grow as this sort of battleground um, inside the blood is, is, is established. So, you know, I, I think we, we sort of see, tend to see the more extreme versions um, of, 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 of what you would expect to see with, with an infection process um, but, uh, or with a vaccine. Uh, yep, so this next question is more to look at the bigger picture of um, cancer treatments. So in comparison to other advances, such as proton beam therapy or nanomedicines, how far do you think that immunology and CAR-T therapy has influenced oncology? Well, yeah, I mean, you're asking someone who's dreadfully biased. And so, you know, I would obviously say that it's revolutionized my practice I, I, and, it, and it has, you know, I, I sort of can, and this is the beauty of being a sort of like a clinician scientist is that um, you, you can sort of detail how a car should look um, and, you know, you can develop it in the laboratory, make it in the clean rooms, you know, give it to the patient, monitor whether it's engrafted in the blood and you sort of see that whole process from the beginning to the end. And I just know, I mean, I regularly in my Monday clinic speak to patients who I know wouldn't be alive if, um, you know, we, we hadn't had the ability to be able to give them these therapies. Um, so, so, you know, I, I can't, like, I can't sort of underplay that. It's a really, it's a really important thing that we've been able to be part of. It's, it's, it's great. So I think, I mean, you know, I mean, Proton Beam is early, early days. It's going to be so exciting when we get that up and running at UCLH and who knows, I mean, combinations may be the future. That's how we may overcome the whole solid tumor challenge. We'll be using things like um, proton beam in conjunction with CAR T cell therapy um, to, to, to really optimize outcomes. So yeah, bias though. Yep, so on to the final question. It's more of a um, related to a case observation. So, um, there has been a slow growing lymphoma that is around 2.5 centimeters to three centimeters in the paraaortic region and it's slow growing so um, there is, the prognosis is to not treat it so what what do you think is the rational behind an observation i mean well here's the thing <laughs> you can't give medical advice out over a public domain so i don't know if this has come from like a patient or but you know there's lots of questions here. What kind of lymphoma is it? What kind of treatment have they had? How fit are they? Have we had a biopsy? You know, have we had a PET scan? So, you know, watch and wait is a common approach that we use for indolent lymphomas. So that's the, the sort of more slow growing sort of lymphomas, so for, for instance, follicular lymphoma. So it would not be inappropriate to watch and wait if someone had a small volume disease that wasn't doing very much, as long as we know that that's what it is. Um, but, you know, again, that doesn't reflect the reality for most of my patients who've got really explosive disease that needs treating right now. 
Okay, so on that clinical note, very sadly, we're out of time and we'll need to leave it, leave it there. However, if you could please provide us with your feedback about today's session by filling out our survey, which will be sent to you following today's session, it would be greatly appreciated. And I hope you've learned something useful to take away from today's lecture. Um, also, we do have another very topical lecture next month, which will be looking at what will the coronavirus do next and what have we learned from it. This lecture will be taking place on the 8th of February with our very own Greg Towers, Professor of Molecular Virology. We would love to see you there and the details for this event and how to register are available on the website. Thank you all for your comments and questions and thank you to especially Dr. Roddy for such an excellent lecture and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much.